Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jordi Williamson from University of Sydney, and he will tell us about geometric satake with coefficients in case theory. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sharing from my iPad, so is it possible to enable me to share from, I think it's the other Jordi Williamson in the chat, in the, in the participants. Oh, there we go. I can now. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, and I'd also like to express my support for colleagues in the Ukraine uh, and point out uh, if someone has not yet seen it, there's in our um, institute, we have a Ukrainian visitor program. which is intended to uh, support displaced Ukrainian mathematicians if they would like to come to Australia and work. Um, so please have a look at that if that is of any interest or use. Okay, so what I am talking about today is in some sense, uh, it's, a, it's an experiment and it is very much uh, work in progress, so. I also think it's a it's a nice story, but it's a story that we're probably not telling in quite the right way. And so uh, I'm hoping to encourage other people to work on what I think is something very interesting. So uh, introduction is, so basically what I'm talking about is, uh, so I'm talking about geometric satake, which is a geometric representation of a category of representations of a an algebraic group. So I want to go over the pieces that we're trying to put together in this project. So if we have a reductive algebraic group, so for example, something like GLN, then we can consider its category of finite dimensional representations. And this is a symmetric tensor category. So just a simple example to have in mind throughout this talk, if we take G to be SL2 over the complex numbers, then we have, so this is an abelian category, we, and we have a tensor product, we have an associator, and it's symmetric. So these are the kind of formal properties of this category. But also, as we learn in the first course in Lie theory, we, there's a lot of kind of basic structure to this category that's very important. So this is, we have this klebsch gordon rule for how to decompose tensor products, et cetera. And I guess when I first met this subject, I kind of thought that, um, that this classification of simples together with these rules are kind of everything about this tensor category. And only later did I appreciate that it's really the, the stru structure tensor category that's really important. So the symmetry and um, associated are, are extremely important structures. And it's a very important basic fact that we can recover G from rep G plus the functor of taking underlying vector space. So we have this tensor functor of vector spaces that just remembers the underlying vector space. And if we're given rep G together with this functor, then we can recover G. And this category of representations is the fundamental object in mathematics, also quantum mechanics, this Klebsch Gordon rule shows up. So, very basic object. Now, the second basic object I want to discuss is the quantum group. So, we have, uh, so we again, the starting point is um, a reductive algebraic group, or for example, a complex semi simple Lie algebra. And then we can define this quantum group, which is a deformation of the enveloping algebra, not in the strict sense, but there, there's a strict sense to which the representation theory of the quantum group is a deformation of the representation theory of the corresponding reductive group. And so in some sense, all of the combinatorics of the representations look the same. So for example, if we look at SL2, we have the same rules of um, tensor product. However, there's a difference in that this is now a braided 
tensor category, so it's not symmetric. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the representation theory looks the same as, rep as representations of SL2, except we have a braiding. So this, this uh, we have a map from V to W, v, v tensor W to W tensor V, and we can go back to, we have another map here to, um, And this composition is not the identity, which is the fact that this is a braided monoidal category and not symmetric. And just to remind you, so dimensions in when we were looking at SL, for example, SL2, we might have a dimension that is two. And when we pass to the quantum group, this gets deformed to a Q number. And these braided um, monoidal categories are interesting for many different reasons. One of the uh, very important reasons is that you get semi-simple uh, fusion categories. So there's a process, I think, originally due to, due to Reshitikin and Turayev that produces semi-simple tensor categories, fusion categories out of this, this data. Right. Now, this, is, this arose um, in the work of uh, Frinfeld and Jimbo. Um, and I think the origin of quantum groups comes from statistical mechanics. Uh, it's the young Baxter equation, et cetera. But it's also shown up in low dimensional topology. So for example, the Jones polynomial is related in a very deep way to the quantum group of SL2. And also it's extremely important in representation theory. So quantum groups at roots of unity uh, approximate in a certain sense, in a very useful sense, representations in positive characteristic. And so this, this was pointed out, I think, originally by Lustig, and then many people have worked on this. Um, so this is uh, the quantum group. Now I move to the um, geometric satake. So this is uh, somehow a lot more difficult, but I just want to explain it in a way that um, I hope you have some sense of what's going on, even if it's not, uh, because it's, it's a difficult subject that takes a lot of time to digest, but I, I feel that one can give the basic ingredients in some reasonable way. So uh, if we start with the connected reactive group, we can associate its Langlands dual group. So basic theorem, I think due to Chevalet, is that reductive groups are classified by root data. There's an obvious symmetry on root data. So root data consists of characters, co-characters, roots, and co-roots. We can swap roots and co-roots and look what group that corresponds to. This provides the Langlands dual group. And we can look at the representation theory of the Langlands dual group over, um, over our field. So this has a, this is a symmetric tensor category. But there's another thing that we can do, which is use our group G, which is the, assumed to lie over C, to produce this affine Grassmannian. So this is this affine grass onion. I missed an N there, but so the affine grass onion, this is an infinite dimensional algebraic variety. Uh, and there's some category of constructible sheaves on this space. And this category of constructible sheaves has a Hence the product operation, which is symmetric. And the geometric Starkey equivalence tells us an equivalence of tensor categories between representations of the dual group and perverse sheaves on this infinite dimensional space. So there's some way of cooking the, out of the geometry of the space, you can cook up the dual group. And so this is important for uh, many different reasons that I'll go over in a second. But let me just give what I think is the most basic reason for the importance of this object. So if we have a connected reductive group, I said before, there's a theorem of Chevalet that classifies these things in terms of root data. And I can swap, I can do this combinatorial swap. And that's my dual group. I think um, I, I want to denote this consistently by checks throughout. So this is the language. Okay, so there's this operation that I can do, but you might complain that this is a very strange way of producing this object. 
you just notice that there's this combinatorial classification. And this is, as far as I know, the geometric shiitake equivalence is, as far as I know, the only way of going from this to the dual group in a canonical way. Okay, so you, you start with your group, you produce some infinite dimensional space. This, this category produces a tensor category from which via the Tanakian formalism you can recover the dual group. So maybe that basic reason already explains why this is a fundamental thing. I'll just go over a few others. So firstly, an example. So let's let's consider G equals SL2. So in this case, the affine Grassmannian has a stratification by with one cell of each dimension. So it has one point, one, one complex line, one complex plane, one complex three-dimensional complex piece. So this looks a little bit like uh, P infinity. So P infinity also has such a stratification. However, the important difference here is that the gluing maps in this space are much more complicated than those of, um, of PN. So if you're if you come from homotopy theory, then this space is homotopic to the base loop space of SU2, which is the maximal compact of SL2. So this is the picture that I want to give, that there's some infinite dimensional space on which we find the representation theory of the dual groups. So just to give uh, some applications of geometric satake, so this equivalence here is a categorification of an isomorphism that was used by Langlands to establish the unramified local Langlands correspondence. And then I think it was Drinfeld that realized that um, in pursuing geometric Langlands that one would have to have such an equivalence in order for geometric Langlands to stand a chance. And recently we've seen, for example, in the work of Gatesbury and others, this equivalence um, providing an essential piece of the geometric Langlands program. And then there's been remarkable work of um, Laforgue which again uses this equivalence to produce um, a crucial piece of the geometric Langlands program, or sorry, the, the Langlands program over function fields. And then recently, um, Farg and Scholz have used that idea to actually give us um, new parts of the local Langlands correspondence. Okay. So this idea is somehow very fundamental to uh, a, a long, a long, period of mathematics around the Langlands program. This is also an uh, extremely useful and, um, and central piece inside in geometric representation theory. Uh, recently, uh, it's, so there's this, uh, I've been working with um, Simon Rich on this um, smith stroman theory, where it gives uh, so the best knowledge so far of mod p representations of algebraic groups. And also it shows up in mathematical physics in the work of, um, of uh, Braverman, Finkelberg and Nakajima in the construction of Coulomb breaks. So I'm aware this is a complicated beast, but um, I'm hoping that it's somewhat motivated. Okay, so this is what the point of this talk is to say, it's to advertise the following fact. Uh, and we definitely haven't proved this in any, in any way. We've just observed this in some very small examples. And I find these small examples interesting and I'll try to explain why. So ba the basic claim is that the representation theory of the quantum group, so one can go back to this slide and say, okay, there's the representation theory of this group related to some kind of fancy things on an infinite dimensional space. Can you modify this in order to produce the quantum group over here? And I think that this is a very basic um, and important question. And what we are observing is that the quantum group appears to be arising when we take sheaves of KU modules on the affine grass money. And I don't expect you to know what that means, and I'll try to try to motivate it a little bit. But yeah, so the slogan is that geometrics, the quantum group arises 
from geometrics to tacky with K theory coefficients. So I'll explain in a little bit more detail what that should mean in a second. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to motivate why I should care about this, this boxed gold. So I should say that there's related work of Cordes Kamnitz and Gates Kiriluri, and also Nakajima has pointed out that K theory is intimately related to the quantum group. So why is this interesting? So you know, may, maybe you're already convinced that the quantum group is is natural, but I I think that the more places in mathematical nature that arises, the the more it appears like a very fundamental and basic object. The other fantasy that I've had for some time is that maybe there are other quantum group-like objects um, related to things in homotopy theory, like Morava K-theories. So another reason that one should would, would hope for such an equivalence or, or, or such a relation is that um, we, we understand the characters of simple representations of the quantum groups at roots of unity, but uh, all proofs are rather difficult. And if one could establish such a claim like this in general, there would be a, a very short proof that characters are controlled by um, Kajanitsic type data. And there's also this Lustig, uh, there's this conjectural Lustig theory of generation. So this is in mod P. representation theory. So what Lustig proposes is that if you look at the modular representation theory of something like uh, SL2 or SL3, then there's a stratification of its, uh, of its representation theory. And this stratification is by these things called generations. And basically, each generation kind of introduces an extra layer of complexity. And so this is very exciting because it provides a conjectural way of, of slicing up difficult questions in modular representation theory into possibly understandable pieces. And when Lustig came up with this idea, many people said this looks very similar to our phenomena in homotopy theory. And somehow at this stage, many, many people have told me Lustig's theory looks like uh, the like heights of formal group laws and that kind of thing in representation theory, in, in homotopy theory. So um, to do with Morava K theories and things like that. But as far as I know, no one has actually got any evidence that there's anything going on here. And the more that people kind of try and fail to make this work, the more that I become suspicious that there's actually something here. But this, so such a relationship would be a kind of very basic starting point for. Um, this conjectural theory of generations. Okay. This is motivation. And now I want to explain a little bit how I think about this. So I just want to explain how I learned things back in the, um, what appears now like when there were dinosaurs roaming the earth. Okay. So I learned that if we have a topological space, we can consider uh, an abelian category of sheaves of vector spaces on that space. And then we can derive this category and we can consider a derived category of sheaves. Now, what I'm gradually learning is that this is the wrong way of looking at things. So the way that um, the youth of today are doing things is rather different you say, okay, we know what it means to have sheaves on X, and we really understand what chain complexes of vector spaces are. So if I think about the derived category of vector spaces, this is a rather, rather boring object. So, so it's not enough to know the derived category of vector spaces. You need to know the, the category of chain complexes of vector spaces as an infinity category. So this gives something called a stable infinity category. And now uh, Lurie and others tell us that you can consider sheaves with values in any infinity category. 
and this produces the same category. So, so the category that I that I cared about, cared about all along. Okay. So that's an incredibly basic um, way of thinking about things. So one way of thinking about this is that infinity categories allow us to reverse order of operations. Before I took X, sheaves, and derived category, and now I can take sheaves of derived category. And one thing that I find very beautiful about this way of thinking about things is that there's a greater separation of sheaves and coefficients. So you really understand what your coefficients are, you really understand what your sheaves are, and then you put them together. You don't do this thing of kind of first mixing sheaves and, and topology a little bit and then deriving. And the other very useful thing about this is that you can take coefficients in um, stable infinity categories. And I should warn you that I really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, this this is the way this is the world in which I'm comfortable with comfortable. But I'm trying to understand this world in examples and trying to understand what people in homotopy theory are telling me. So so the the upshot of this is uh, you can take coefficients in any stable bicomplete infinity category. And you get um, this category of sheets. And there's a six functor formalism. And somehow people um, were telling me that this thing exists for some time, but there was no reference. But now there's this lovely paper of Marco Volpa called the six operations uh, in topology, which is really beautiful to read. So, to any E infinity ring spectrum. So one can think about this as being um, to any cohomology theory uh, satisfying something like a Kunitz formula. There's a stable uh, infinity category of modules over that. Sorry, that should be E modules. Such that the good old derived category that I know and love is sheaves of modules over the Island Berg McLean spectrum of your ring. And another way that's useful for me to think about this is that. Uh, so I'm used to the fact that if I have a space X. and I take the constant sheaf on X, and I take the derived global sections, this gives me cohomology. And what this is saying is that for any cohomology theory, there's something similar you can do. So for example, on X, you can put a constant sheaf of, um, of KU modules, and the global sections of that object will give you the K theory of X. And similarly for any um, any cohomology theory. So in some sense, another way of thinking about this is that if you think about cohomology, so there's the version that you learn, and then the algebraic geometers typically learn constructible sheaves, and you have a six functor formalism, and you have intersection cohomology, you have all this stuff. And then the homotopy theorists have uh, K theory, they have Morava K theories, they have elliptic cohomology, they have all this stuff that the algebraic geometers don't understand, and the topologists don't understand the six functor formalism. And somehow now there's a way of talking about both theories at once. Okay? So there's six functor formalism for computing uh, things like Morava K theories and stuff like that. So I don't understand any of this very particularly well. And when I don't understand something, I do exactly what this little baby is doing. I just stick it in my mouth and play with it okay? and try to work out what's going on. And so that's what the rest of the talk is about. I'm just kind of sticking this stuff in my mouth and trying to play with it and see what comes out and trying to guess, guess what's there. Yeah? So now I want to tell you a kind of different story uh, which is Zogel biomodules and another way of algebraically thinking about geometric satake. So Ben Elias, who I work with this stuff on, calls this algebraic geometric satake. OK, 
Okay, so this should be very familiar. If I have a finite file group, I have the action on the Cartel subalgebra. And then I can consider uh, the symmetric algebra of H. So this is a graded algebra with W action. And so this is a con the, the following is a consequence of geometry sake, which I think is rather, rather surprising. So if G is an adjoint group, for example, PSL2, there is a tensor functor from representations of G to graded bimodules over the subring of invariance in the symmetric algebra. So this is like a basic consequence of geometric Sutake, but I don't think it's, it's that well, well known. And I think it's surprising, and I don't think that we really um, understand it as well as we should. So you might say, why did I say adjoint here? Uh, so basically because I want to save a little bit of notation. It's very easy with a little, with a few more slides, I can replace G adjoint with G connected reductive. Right? So one shouldn't see the adjoint bit there as a um, major hindrance. So still rather, um, still rather mysterious, I think this, this statement. So uh, this, this innocent looking statement that there's a tensor functor, so this is a fully, functor, fully faithful tensor functor, uh, is the only proof that I know passes through a hell of a lot of material, and yet it seems like a very elementary statement. And somehow when I was preparing this talk, I was remi again reminded that I feel like there should be some kind of elementary um, explanation of this. And um, the other thing that's interesting about this is that here the symmetry is manifest, whereas the symmetry on the on these graded, so these are graded RW bimodules, and I can take the tensor product, and the, the, the fact that this tensor product is symmetric is rather mysterious. Okay. So there's this very interesting work of um, Lustig and Ji Wei Yun, and also this was used by Xin Wen Zhu in a, in a powerful way. Um, so in principle, there's a way of proving that this right-hand side is symmetric, but it's it's rather involved. Okay. So maybe this fact already tells you that this is maybe not so not so trivial. Okay, so geometric attack through the lens of Zergo biomodules. So I just want to explain briefly how this works. So we consider a representation of um, G check. There's this geometric Sataki equivalence that tells us that we can um, realize this degree of certain sheaves on a space. And now uh, remember that this space was And so I can instead regard this category of perverse sheaves as being a category of bi, bi equivariant sheaves on the loop group. And then on this category, there's this functor of hypercohomology, and this lands me in bimodules. And this is my um, this is my functor from before. So I said before there's a functor for representations of G to bimodules, and this is what the functor is. And Somehow Zergel bimodule magic tells you that this functor is monoidal and it's fully faithful, which gives you the previous slide. But what's the observation here, which is me kind of just sticking things into my mouth, is that this allows us to, so, you know, some, some people tell me I should consider some kind of sheaves on Gro G with coefficients in something crazy. And Zergel bimodules provide a clue as to how this should work. So as to what the, um, so we can do computations in, in bimodule land that give us some picture about what this category should look like. Okay. So, so this is the setting. I have these sheaves of KU modules, I can take global sections, and now I get bio modules over the um, equivariant K theory of a point. Okay. So just to remind you, this is a rather concrete object. This is like um, co-characters of letters of T. Um, 
W invariants. Okay, so th these are bimodules over reasonably explicit rings. Uh, and th there's computations over here, which are, it's basically hopeless for me to try to do, but I can do them over here and just see what, what, what pops out and maybe make some kind of interesting, interesting observation or conjecture. So the theorem with Ben Elias is that under this very restrictive set of, so I'm only allowed SL2, SL3, or SP4. Under these very restrictive um, settings, there's um, a functor from the kind of adjoint representations of the quantum group to K theory bimodules. So again, I'm glossing over the adjoint versus simply connected thing just to simplify notation. Again, the braiding is completely mysterious. We don't see the braiding at all. Um, and these are really like, you know, even for these pretty simple groups, like this one took us about two months, I think, SP4. Um, and G2 is totally out of reach. I mean, for me, you know, Ben is one of the best computers I know, so perhaps he can do it, but I definitely can't. Uh, so this, I, I'm interpreting this sign, this theorem as a sign that something interesting is going on, but also I should say that I don't think this is the correct way of doing things, but I'm hoping to inspire others to do things a better way. So, you know, I, I'm not planning on proving this theorem by brute force computation in all Lie types, which would at present be absolutely impossible. So just a rough idea of how this proof goes. So we know both sides explicitly via generators and relations in all those, so in these three groups, in these three cases I listed, we know both categories via generators and relations. So here's generators and relations for SL2. So this is, for example, a representation from V tends to V to the trivial. This is from the trivial to V tensor V, and then you have these beautiful relations. Okay, so we know the source of our functor by generates relations, and if you know the source of something by generates relations, it's easy to define a functor. You just need to say where things go and check relations. And that's what we need, what we do. Um, so the, the target is also no, known by generates relations. So that's not quite true. We, we don't know that we have all the relations, but so this is, Singular K theory bimodules, singular K theory Zirkel bimodules. So that's kind of a mouthful. We, we don't know all relations, but we know some relations, and these relations are enough to check um, that we have a filter. Okay, so I'm not going to explain these pictures. If you've seen things similar, it might invoke some, uh, some memories, hopefully not traumatic. Uh, yeah, so as an example, um, you know, in, our, in the baby case of SL2, this generator goes to this particular map between singular K theory bimodules. And then we have a computation with them as your operators that gives us the, um, gives us the relation that we want if mu and mu are chosen correctly. And something very interesting in case people have, uh, For kind of more for the specialists or maybe for people that know something about K theory. In normal Zirkel, Zirkel bimodule theory in equivariant cohomology, you have very few units around and so things are very canonical. Whereas in K theory, you have way more units. And so there's a lot more choices in terms of um, in terms of basic structures. And so what we show is that we can make these choices in some way to make something work, but it doesn't seem very canonical. Um, and it seems that we're missing missing something from K-theory, some facts from K-theory. Uh, okay, so this is just a little thing, a part of this story that somehow for me was incredibly satisfying. Uh, so there's a recipe, which I, I kind of haven't told you, but so we can start from the Cartel matrix of type AN tilde, and there's this procedure 
the singular zergot biomodules that produces this tensor category of rep SLN. Now, what Ben Elias noticed in 2014, and I was really surprised by this observation, is that if you take this Tato matrix and you change it in a very subtle way, so you replace minus one in the top right hand corner by minus Q, so you deform the Tato matrix, but not in the typical way. So there's People have studied deformations of Cartel matrices where you put Q plus Q inverse, you put quantum two down the diagonal. This is not what we're doing. We're deforming it in a different way. Now, what uh, Ben noticed is if you do this deformation and you perform the same recipe, you get the quantum group. And I've always been fascinated by this observation. And somehow with Ben, we tried for many years to deform the Cartel matrices of other types in order to produce quantum groups in other types. And somehow, um, you know, for me, it was a real aha moment that this deformation comes from K-theory. So there's this very unique fact in K-theory, which is that this inclusion of kind of cohomology into K-theory is equivalent for the symmetric group, but in no other type, you have such an equivalent embedding. And so in some sense, this, this this um, Cartel matrix was a red herring, a type A red herring, and K-theory provided a way of resolving it. Okay. And that's why we worked so hard to check that um, SP4 works, because this was the only case that was not covered by Ben's um, observation. Okay, so final remarks. The braiding is mysterious. I've said that a number of times, it's still mysterious. Uh, yeah, it seems that we need the affine Grassmannian for the twisted loop group, and I don't understand why that is at all. Um, so this seems to show up when we when we take the quantum dimension of the natural representation of SP4. If we don't use the twisted um, loop group, we get quantum four, which is wrong. The quantum dimension should be quantum five minus one. Uh, so the Q in the quantum group is the, related to the square root of loop rotation for the experts. And uh, so the relation to cordis Chemnitz, are, so they have um, really beautiful work relating um, algebraic K theory of the, uh, of the affine grass mining in type A to the quantum group. This seems very close to what we're doing. There's also this construction of the quantum group uh, by Gates, Gree, and Lurie, and this seems very, very far away from what we're doing, and I don't understand the connection at all. Uh, thank you.